But I'm going to turn it uh, this evening over to Tyler Long. Tyler is a senior uh, studying political science, is a Rubenstein scholar, vice president of Ag advocacy for Duke Life, and just finished his last day of student teaching and will be graduating from Duke and headed off to, to law school. Uh, Tyler is going to be tonight's moderator. Uh, we're going to encourage you to to throw questions in the chat and we will save time at the end of this evening's uh, presentation to do so. So I'm going to turn it over to Tyler. Thank you. All right. I actually know quite a few people in the, in the panel or, you know, of the attendees today. So that makes me feel, uh, you know, at ease as we moderate this panel, good turnout as well. Um, so we're going to start off with some introductions of our panelists. Um, uh, so I'm going to, you know, go one by one, uh, with their names and have them uh, tell us a little bit about themselves and their career background, uh, including their current role and organization that they're working on currently, um, as well as their degree at Duke when they graduated, things like that. Um, so the first one on my list is Rachel. So we'll start with you. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. So my name is Rachel Garcia and I currently live in Austin, Texas. I graduated from Duke in 2012 and I was a psychology major sociology minor. In my career, I've had a lot of different roles in different organizations, but I'll give you a short story. I started out in merchandise planning and then moved into some sales roles, decided I wanted to switch into HR. So I ended up going to grad school to get a master's in HR. And now I'm currently a people partner at an ed tech startup called Remind. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Let's go to Fabio. Hello, everyone. My name is Fabio Osorio. Um, currently, I'm in Buffalo, New York. Um, I'm originally from Lima, Peru. Uh, my family relocated to the US when I was um, only 13. Um, I grew up in the um, uh, uh, DC area, um, super close to Montgomery County. I don't know if, if any of you know the area. Um, I graduated from college back in 2009 in economics, uh, became extremely passionate about finance and investments. Um, I worked in financial planning, wealth management for about seven years or so. Um, then I realized that I wanted to do something a little bit more impactful with my career. I wanted to align my career with my upbringing. Um, so I decided to go back to school and get my MBA at Duke. Uh, that was back in uh, 2017. And then upon graduating from, from Fuqua, I relocated to Buffalo and currently I'm working for MNT Bank uh, within the multicultural banking team. Our job is to um, enhance the experience of the banking experience of multicultural communities um, that have been historically marginalized. So many of those communities today are for the most part underserved or, or underbanked. Um, and uh, I love my job. Um, it's, it's a good way for me to make an impact and at the same time leverage my six, seven years of banking experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Brittany. Hey everyone, I'm uh, sorry, I'm having internet issues. Um, so I'm calling in from my phone, um, but um, I graduated pretty recently uh, in 2020. Uh, so I'm in my first full-time job. I studied public policy, international creative studies, and did the markets management certificate while I was at Duke, and am now a business analyst at McKinsey. So if anyone's interested in talking about consulting, more than happy to. Um, I just hit my six month mark um, at the firm. So um, it's been an interesting journey starting virtually, but um, throughout Duke, I interned at various companies, everything from working on Wall Street for a summer to working at a tech company um, to doing Duke in DC, where I had the opportunity to work both at a nonprofit and a federal government agency. So more than happy to kind of talk about how I navigated um, professional life, both, you know, in Duke and how it, the real world is outside of Duke once you graduate. Um, so very jealous that all of you are still at Duke since I really miss it. And it hasn't been that long since I've said goodbye. Awesome, thank you, Brittany. Uh, let's go to Haluk. Hi everyone, my name is Haluk Shabander. I graduated in 2018 um, with majors in psychology and Middle Eastern studies. 
uh, following graduation, I moved back to my hometown, uh, Arizona, uh, basically just to help my mother grow a center for children with uh, disabilities and autism. Um, and that was kind of the continuation of, of work that I had done to support my mother while I was a first generation student at Duke. Um, after that, so I did that for about two years. Following that time, I uh, started working for Ed Plus um, as an associate, and that's my current role right now. Um, basically, our organization produces educational material for students across the Middle East and tries to kind of support the uh, educational infrastructure of that region to increase access to opportunities for those uh, for that community. Um, yep. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about kind of untraditional, uh, non-traditional career paths, because I've, I also transitioned from pre-med to pre-law, and I'm currently applying to law school. And so I'm sure that many of us kind of share that uncertainty about what we want to do with our lives. And, and so I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Awesome. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have David Robertson. Hi everyone, my name is David. I am currently in Washington, DC. I also grew up around the area. Um, I graduated in 2015 from Duke with a uh, degree in public policy. Immediately after Duke, I spent a year and a half uh, doing a fellowship through the Sanford School, uh, the public policy school, where I lived and worked in Brazil uh, at a small nonprofit. Um, after that, I spent a short time in Kenya at the UN and then spent a year studying in China at um, university called Tsinghua University, where I got a master's in uh, global affairs. Uh, after that, from that, I then have spent the last subsequent three years at Delta Airlines in a rotational program that they have focused on international expansion. Uh, and so I have been a part of the uh, team that basically decides where and how and when we fly to Asia and making sure the planes are full and making money. Uh, and in the fall, I will be heading to business school. So happy to chat about any and all aspects of that as well. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, so obviously a very esteemed uh, panel today um, with, with plenty of, of diversity in their jobs um, and career paths. So uh, definitely going to be an awesome panel. So uh, let's take you all back to when you were uh, Duke students. So as you reflect on your own experience as a uh, first-gen low-income, uh, first-gen or low-income student at Duke, uh, what do you think are the uh, skills you developed that have made you successful thus far in your career? So if you guys can use that, uh, that raise hand function and, and I will call on as they go. So at Duke, what are some of the skills you think you developed that have made you successful thus far in your career? I don't see the right hand option, <laughs> but I'm happy to go first. Sure, yeah. Um, so from a qualitative standpoint, I mean, I think, I think Duke has an amazing collaborative community. I think that's something that, especially at work today, I mean, we're constantly collaborating with multiple teams within the organization. I mean, part of my job is to, you know, we own the strategy and then many other teams own the execution. Um, so definitely having the ability to, um, communicate well what the strategy is and then uh, build a team around a particular mission, I think is extremely important. Um, it's something that gets uh, underestimated um, a lot, I think, especially in business. That's one. Second, I think just coming from a kind of like low income, first generation college grad background, I, I think, um, you know, you because of the background, I think we, we tend to become more empathetic, right, with the people that we want to support in our case, um, especially for, for my job. Empathy is extremely important to develop solutions that will actually resonate with folks, with, with customers. Um, so that's, that's extremely important. And I, I think that's something that is extremely valuable. Like if you're trying to build solutions that support some of these communities, Obviously, you know, if you come from that particular community, in a way you're scratching your own itch. So that's also extremely, extremely valuable. Thank you. Uh, Halu? Yeah, I think uh, the points that Fabio made were, were great, but especially what resonates with me is 
um, the point about empathy. I think in my current job, especially, you know, I'm working with a vulnerable community. Um, many times it's refugees or it's uh, students that don't really understand how to navigate the international um, education opportunities abroad. And so just uh, the ability to just see from another person's perspective and create um, products that um, that that would be useful to them um, is uh, uh, it's very it's, it's really important and uh, I think that empathy goes a long way but also I think in my case I just had to I remember when I got to Duke um, Duke really challenges you I think as a first generation low income student to really reflect on who you are and and to really build confidence in, in who you are as a person, right? Because you're entering this community where other people may not necessarily look like you. You have to navigate um, different hurdles. And so uh, I think for me, it just, it forced me to um, develop, whether it was my communication skills, um, confidence in myself, right? And just being uh, comfortable with um, who, who who you are and not necessarily, and just trying to be, um, yeah, just trying try just to be yourself. I think that goes a long way because in the end, no matter what company you're joining, in the end, you're just working with other people. And um, uh, it's it's really important to just, uh, I think for a team, whenever they're, anyone that's recruiting someone for their company is always thinking about, you know, whether they'll enjoy working with this individual. And so um, really being comfortable with yourself and, and confident and being able to communicate um, what your goals are, that that can go a long way um, in, in helping you get, get you know, get whatever job you're looking for. Yeah, I think the confidence is, is definitely one that a lot of first-gen students definitely have to build up in their time at Duke. So I, I appreciate that insight. Yeah. Uh, David? Uh, building off this idea of confidence, one thing that really struck me when I first started working at, um, at Delta, I mean, airlines are really niche business, like business. And so it took me a long time to figure out what people were even talking about, let alone coming into my first professional job at a big, massive corporation. I was super intimidated because it felt like I could never really add value. Um, no matter how much I would learn, I still felt like, oh, this is a dumb idea because someone probably already thought of it. Um, and I think that's just natural when you're first starting out at a, at a new job, but particularly at a massive organization, it was the first experience I had with that. Uh, so one, two things that I, uh, learned how to do and skills I think I built were one, how to ask questions, like how to test out, you know, ask a question to someone and like monitor how they respond. And if they're really receptive to that, and, like make a mental note, like, okay, I can go back to them with maybe a few more questions because they're really willing to help me. Um, so asking questions is a huge thing. And then the second one was writing down everything. I literally from day one at Delta, it's been three years, have taken notes every single meeting just because it helps me organize my own thoughts and helps me be able to find those questions to ask back. This is the notebook that I'm using currently, but I mean, I have many more. And so that's just something that, a little quick tidbit that I found to be extremely useful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, thank you. I'm also using my notebook during all of this, so <laughs> I, I, can, I can sympathize with that. Yep, yep, and, and Greg as well. <laughs> yeah, Rachel. Yeah, I was going to add to that. I think my experience as, a first generation college student has really um, increased just the general resourcefulness that I have because going into school, a lot of people in my family, um, my parents didn't go to college, but a lot of people just in general, my family didn't go to school and then trying to get into a school like Duke, I was figuring that out pretty much on my own. And so after I got there, even finding internships and all of that, um, knowing where to go, I'm glad I found the career center while I was at Duke. That was so helpful. Um, but Sometimes navigating those processes, it can feel like I was, I felt like I was a little lost. So I learned some resourcefulness, how to make things happen, and also how to be a self-starter, because there are times when um, you have to go take the initiative, meet people, introduce yourself, comfortable. And especially, I would say, in my current role, I'm in a startup environment. And so we don't have all the resources of a large company and a lot of times I'm doing things for the very first time. So I have to go get people excited about my idea, make sure they know what I'm trying to do, influence in that way, and then uh, try to get the company excited about it so I can actually impl implement the idea. So I think that um, ability to just be a self-starter and network with other people has taken me a long way. 
Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I, I loved all of those answers. Um, so sort of in the same vein of this question, right, let's take the employee hat off uh, for a second and put the recruiter hat on. So let's say you're recruiting uh, for your organization um, and, and you have some, some first-gen low-income students that are, are applying to work uh, at your company. What are some of the unique qualities of a first-gen and or low-income student? Uh, what are some unique qualities of those students um, that current students uh, should highlight in their internship and job searches? I, I can go first. Um, so uh, the company I work for, we actually had a first-gen low-income info session last week. Um, and this is one of the questions that we had gotten asked from some of the students who attended. And I think first-gen students um, have so many skills, like what Rachel was saying about resourcefulness, like that goes such a long way, especially in a job like mine in consulting where you're, you have no work schedule, you have no idea what every day looks like. You're working for your clients and you have to learn how to be really scrappy, be really resourceful, and be able to, you know, deliver like good quality work. Um, and sometimes, you know, it gets really hard, especially, you know, for me starting in a completely virtual environment, not necessarily having met my coworkers in person. But I think first gen students have, you know, one, you were able to go to do, you know, obviously be successful at Duke since you're, you're still here, which already says so much. So I think, you know, go into an interview or a networking session with a lot of confidence that you like made it so much farther than like statistically, like people said you would go and just be able to communicate your story. Just say like, hey, like I'm first gen, um, this is where I come from. And this is why I'm curious about this industry. And for me, for consulting, like my story was always, I didn't have a lot of exposure to a lot of industries or, you know, companies until coming to Duke. And I thought consulting was the best way for me to keep exploring because that's what we do is work on solving different problems for different industries. And that's why I communicated that I would be able to be adaptable and resourceful because, you know, being first gen and um, moving across the country to go to Duke um, like shows that I can be successful in those situations. So that's like what I would be confident in that all of you have and be able to communicate that in an interview. Awesome. Yeah. This, I think this resourcefulness is, is definitely a, a theme that we're going to see when it comes to, to working uh, while first gen. Um, so yeah, uh, that's great. Yeah. Fabia. Yeah. I just want to, Add to that because I mean I think I think those are great points. Um, so I've I've interviewed a bunch of people before, and when I think about the background of a first generation college student or graduate, I mean I think I think about all the different challenges that they had to overcome to get to where they are today, and I think you should definitely highlight that, right? Um, when I think of a student, you know, of of such background. In my mind, I'm like, okay, you got a hundred and now you have, you produce a thousand, right? Whereas like everybody else got 500 and they still produce a thousand, right? Because they're going to the same school, they're taking the same courses as you are. And that's something that you should definitely highlight. Also the, the execution, right? So it goes back to being scrappy. It goes back to um, being ingenious, right? Because you had to come up with workarounds, you know, um, you probably face some challenges at home, at school, lack of resources. Um, so it really goes back to execution. I think there are a lot of, a lot of the smart people out there. And, and if you're a Duke, you're obviously very, very smart, but sometimes being a smart doesn't translate into execution. But I, I do know that because of your background and, and where you are today, you had to execute, right? So definitely highlight that during your interviews, make sure that you're able to demonstrate, this is what I've done, this is how I did it, this is why I did it, right? Um, I think that will, that will resonate a lot with, with people who are hiring people to ultimately like drive, you know, um, and lead, lead teams, right? Drive initiatives and, and ultimately deliver and provide results. Awesome, love that answer. Yeah, any other panels feel like you have some other uh, 
qualities that you think should be highlighted. I think we touched on a lot of a lot of really good ones. Uh, yeah, David. I think another thing to to work into your answer, your answers or, or just your themes as you're preparing for your interview is also empathy. I think it was touched on before, besides being scrappy and resourceful, which will go a long way. I think somehow tying into your the stories you tell and the experiences that you highlight, um, bringing in how you um, have made space for others or uh, highlighted the what someone else on your team did or something of that nature is I think, um, I think is it something that is quite strong for FGLI students um, and is important to highlight as well. And, and I understand that perhaps you might not be, and I, I don't know if I would be either comfortable like saying like, you know, I'm first gen FGLI, like this is, this is why, but you can still tie those themes into the stories you tell. Um, so I think that, but I think that's something important to highlight uh, specifically. Yeah, great. That empathy, resourcefulness, overcoming challenges, um, workarounds, execution. I think all of those are really great. Yeah. Um, so from, from hearing the introduction of the panelists, uh, we have um, uh, one Duke MBA uh, graduate. We have two um, that in their introduction said they were going to be going to graduate school. I don't know if others um, went and didn't, just didn't say that in their uh, introduction. Um, but do you guys think that completing a graduate degree um, was advantageous to get your position? Or if you're going soon, like why, why now um, on, on going to, to grad school at this point? Yeah, I can start. So I went to grad school about, let's see, five years after I left undergrad. And for me, it was about switching into a new field. So I was in sales. I wanted to switch into HR. I'd started to apply for roles and look at what was out there. And I realized at the companies I wanted to work for at the time, a lot of them hired people who had master's degrees. And that was the route to get the income and the position that I wanted. And so that's why I went back and it worked out. You know, I got a job at one of those companies. I got to intern there. So it was a really great experience. Overall, though, I probably could have um, eventually gotten to the same place. It may have taken longer or looked different. Um, or if I wanted to stay at my company, I think it's a little easier when you're switching careers. If you stay within the same company, switch into a different function there and then go to a new company, that's a little easier. So for me, it made sense. But I also think I could have gotten to the same place without graduate school. It also was a nice time to really reflect on my past experiences, get clear on what I wanted. So for me, it was a personal development opportunity as well as professional more than anything. But I don't think it's necessary um, today for a lot of different roles, depending on what you're doing. Uh, for me, it wasn't 100% necessary. So I, I, I love that answer because I, you know, obviously I'm a little bit biased because I went to Duke for my MBA and, um, and, and I mean, I, I, I wanted to go back because I was looking to um, two things. I wanted to get grounded in all areas of business. Um, you know, I, I had uh, already specialized in, in wealth management and financial planning, um, taking a holistic approach to wealth management. And I, I thought that was great. But then I, I realized I didn't know much about like finance. I didn't know much about marketing. I didn't know much about strategy. I didn't know. I had read some books and I thought I knew some, but I, I knew I didn't know enough. That's, that's one. Um, but then second, I, I was looking for an opportunity to explore something that, again, to me, felt more impactful. Um, and, and, I, and I believe that having the opportunity to go back to school and, and, and explore that with people who were um, kind of like in a similar position was going to be a great opportunity for me to develop. Um, but... Um, so it worked out well for me <laughs> in that in that regard, but um, because now I'm working and, and I'm doing I'm doing exactly that. Um, but I do think you know it's you know whether whether grad school is for you or not, I think is really context dependent, right? Um, I think uh, I think that's something that you you need to evaluate, right? You need to you need to start with kind of like what the end goal is. What are you trying to achieve ultimately? Like where do you where do you see yourself in the next I don't know, um, you know, 36 months in the next five years, in the next 10 years, um, where are you right now? And then, and then ask yourself the question of is the MBA or is the, 
you know, the MPP or the MPA or whatever other, you know, um, degree, is that going to help you achieve your goals? Um, that in addition to um, doing some personal reflection, right? Do you, do you actually need that um, based on your environment today, right? Um, based on, again, the career path that you want to take. So it's really context dependent. Um, and I think you need to do some personal reflection to be able to evaluate that as well, right? Um, on top of that, I mean, there is a, there is a huge cost, right? When you, when you go back to school, it's not only um, the, the price tag that you have to pay for your education, but it's also the time that you're spending on that right? And the opportunity cost. I mean, you could be spending your time on so many other things that could be, I don't know, spending time with family, friends, or building a business if that's what you want to do. Um, so there are a lot of like costs and benefits, right? That you need to balance out. Um, so I'll post right there. <laughs> I think I, I gave you guys a lot, but uh, so it really goes back to your, your specific situation. What are you trying to achieve? Where are you now? What is your environment like? And then, and then ask yourself the question of, is the, is the MBA, MPA, MPP is going to help you achieve that? I'm going to jump in real quick and just say if anyone has specific questions about paying for grad school or how to try to get some of that covered, um, I'm happy to chat because I, I was able to get my you know tuition and fees and all that covered. But as Fabio said, there's still that opportunity cost of missed salary and other things that um, I missed out on while I was there, but I'm happy to chat if anyone's interested in HR in general, getting grad school um, paid for, what are some options there? Just let me know. Awesome. We love the connections. Yeah. Haluk? Yeah. So um, I think something uh, that we should talk about also is uh, when you decide to go to grad school, that's a really big question, right? So I started out uh, pre-med and my intention was, you know, I remember before I um, as a high school senior, my plan was to go to Duke, graduate. I, I wanted to go to Duke Med, and by now I'm supposed to be some type of like neurosurgery resident or whatever. Well, I mean, clearly that you know I'm in a different path because now I'm three years out. I'm currently applying to law school, and um, I just remember throughout undergrad just having a sense of anxiety about when I would go, whether I should. I, I just I always wanted to just save time and just go automatically. Uh, to grad school and just make it to my end goal. And part of my motivate, part of my reason for that was because I was motivated, you know, just, it was just financial motives. I just wanted to just to graduate and be able to just support my family. And so I never really took a step back to think about, am I actually going to enjoy this career that I'm investing 15 years of my life and 500 grand into right medicine. Um, and then I graduated, I was studying for the MCAT. And during that time, um, you know, the first year was passing and, uh, I, I just felt like, and I, um, met my current mentor, who's an attorney. And, uh, that's when I first, for the first time in my life, I started really considering becoming an attorney, um, which I'd always been, uh, which I'd always wanted to do, but never had thought that could actually be a reality. And now three years out and entering my fourth year out of, you know, out of Duke, I've just come to realize that the time that time shouldn't really when you're thinking about how many gap years you want to take, all that should really matter is that you're doing something useful during that time, right? Like as long as you're learning and you're improving and you're growing, I think that's all that's really important. And um, I think sometimes sometimes we have an anxiety about trying to move faster, but uh, uh, you know, so it's just something just to in, uh, think about in your reflection, like Fabio said. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, David. Hello, oh, that's a really great point. I think I can totally echo it. I mean, if I remember, I think if I were sitting here as a senior, I was going to do my one-year fellowship and then go to law school. Well, it is six years later and I am not going to law school. Um, so just the point that is to say, and much like to what Rachel had pointed out, I decided to go to business school as a very strategic pivot into something that I really specifically wanted to do, um, which I knew that would be would be much harder if I didn't uh, go back to business school. It's sort of a reset in a lot of ways. Um, but sort of just tying all everyone, what everyone has said together, I think that particularly the point about not feeling you have to rush is, is really important. Yeah, maybe I wish I would have heard this before applying to law school this year, but that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're still, 
That's true. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. So we're sort of, uh, oh, Holly, do you have something to add to that as well? No, I just, uh, I'm still learning how to use this lower hand function. I know. See, it's the teacher in me that I'm, I'm using this, but if it, I'm, I know my students struggle with it too. So it's okay. Um, so uh, I'm kind of jumping all over the timeline right now of your lives, but we're going to jump back to Duke for a moment um, and, and reflect back on that time again. Uh, is there a particular person, office, or resource at Duke uh, that you found to be really helpful during your time on campus um, that you would, that you would want, like to bring people's attention to? I was, I was just going to say that one resource I immediately thought of was the Duke Financial Economic Center. This is if you're at all interested in finance, um, but John Cacavalli, who's a great economics professor at Duke, was actually first gen himself when he went to Duke. So he really helped me navigate, you know, what it means to, you know, want to explore finance or even how to fit in culturally um, during my internship and just helped me feel more confident going into that summer. But even before that, like helped to prepare me for my interviews, even taught me how to read the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so I highly recommend using him as a resource if you're at all interested in um, going into a career in finance. Um, both him and Emma are both like really great thought partners and like really helped me navigate networking sessions, what classes I should take to prepare. Um, yeah, just highly recommend going into their office hours sometime. Okay, I guess Greg did not ask me to say this, but the Duke Career Center <laughs> is the resource that I found most helpful while I was at Duke. I actually volunteered for the Career Center um, starting in spring of my freshman year and through my senior year. And that was a great way just to get to know employers. I did um, kind of introductions with them when they came on campus. I also started going to the career fairs freshman year. I didn't plan on really interning that year, but just wanted to get familiar with what kind of questions do they ask you? How do you talk to people? And um, how do you get your resume together? Just being prepared was extremely helpful. And then going into that interview process senior year, doing mock interviews with people, and also just having a partner with, uh, there was a woman who worked at the career center named Anne, and even brainstorming with her, like, what job should I apply to? She actually pointed out a company I would have never thought of, and I ended up going to work there. So it's nice to have some additional thought partners who can say, oh, maybe you should look at this opportunity that you wouldn't be open to. And I wanted to point out another thing for me. I was a psych major. I wanted to go into business. A lot of the roles I was looking at, they wanted you to have analytical experience. And I knew I could do that. Like I had good analytical skills, but my resume didn't lend itself to that. So it was also helpful to have someone say, here are some creative ways you can show that you are analytical, even though you don't have a corporate internship. I volunteered every summer, so I didn't have those skills on my resume. So I was able to volunteer at a student organization, become a treasurer, get some analytical skills there. I was doing an independent study project that required some data pooling. And I also just brought in some personal experience and actually ended up getting moved on from round one to round two of my interview process because I connected with the interviewer on my love of volunteering and service. And that was important to the company. So I want to say, even if you don't feel like you fit the box for a specific company, please go talk to someone at the Career Center, get some ideas, start brainstorming how you can uh, close the gap between, you know, where you think you might be missing some things for the role you want, because it might surprise you where you can uh, actually fill in those gaps with things you're already doing. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Fabia? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll just add to that. I mean, I think, um, you know, reaching out to other alumni, I think is also very powerful. I mean, there are people out there who went to Duke, who, who want to give back to the community, um, who've got, who have gone through this process already and can give you some really, really good insights. So when it comes to resources, assets in front of you that you can definitely take advantage of is, is the students, right? Alumni, people that have attended Duke. Um, when I was pursuing my MBA, I mean, a club that um, welcomed me with their um, arms up and was the, the Duke Fuqua Black and Latino MBA organization. Um, I, 
I've I felt so welcomed by by them and and there were so many people with with very similar backgrounds even though they were from so many different locations and um and places i just felt like i was at home and i knew i could reach out to them at any point in time um those who were kind of like managing the the club as well as the students yeah i i really could uh ask you all and pick your brains for three hours myself just with the questions that i have in front of me um, but like Greg said, um, feel free to throw specific questions in the chat. Uh, we kind of open it up to, to everyone here. Any questions you all have, um, be sh just go ahead and throw those in the chat. Um, we have some rapid fire questions while people throw some in the chat uh, that I forgot about until this very moment. And I was very excited about them. So I'm going to cut down on the amount so we can get to everyone's questions that they put in the chat. Um, but I'm going to ask you all some questions. Uh, they require a one to two word response. Um, and, and of course, you could have a yes, but and no, but, but we just want a yes or no or a number or a name or something like that. Uh, and, and then just cut it off. Um, so the first one, uh, yes or no. Have you ever questioned your career path? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it seems like that one was a pretty unanimous there. Um, absolutely question career path. I am not even in a career path yet and I'm already questioning it. So I think I could echo that. Um, um, on a scale of one to five, one being strongly disagree, strongly disagree and five being strongly agree, uh, your role offers a work-life integration uh, balance. So you have a good work-life balance in your, in your job, one to five. Can I say 4.5? Sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> I'll say three. I'm a, I'm a 3.5. <laughs> I would say about a, a four. I would say about a two and a half, just with the amount of travel that normally right, happens. Least, Not right now. Right, yeah. We're at least at a 50% for everyone. So we love that. <laughs> we have at least that. Um, uh, and we're still monitoring the chat for questions, so feel free to throw some in there. Uh, but uh, one word, fill in the blank. A blank is a skill that you use almost every day, if not every day. David, yours could be hyphenated. It could be note-taking. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I would probably say Excel. Uh, mm. So I a little asterisk next to that. If you don't have any experience with Excel, maybe spend some time getting to know it. I came to my job with zero experience to Excel and would highly recommend at least some. It'll just make your life easier. I I agree with that. I would I would say for me it's listening. So really paying attention to what you know, whether you're interviewing a customer um, or talking to a colleague like demonstrating that you're listening and then truly listening to be able to capture those insights, whatever you're trying to learn, I think is extremely valuable. I use that every day. I would echo that as well. I'd say listening as well. Relationship building for me. Hmm. Top-down communication for me, being able to turn really complex problems and communicate it in a way that people understand. Yeah, awesome. Oh, I love these rapid fire questions. Um, and then finally, our final rapid fire question. I personally um, just want to know your favorite study spot when you were at Duke. What was your favorite place to study? This one's easy for me. My, my apartment or my dorm room, because I did not study as much as I should have. <laughs> so I was always cramming it in last minute. <laughs> Same. I can go next. Um, I would say, I don't remember the name of the building and it hasn't been, it's only been three years, but um, since I graduated, uh, it, it's the environmental science building um, or environmental, what is it called? I don't know. The Nicholas it's School. That, I don't know yeah, it's, it's that, um, it's a building with a really nice uh, rooftop view, of basically the whole campus. And you can see just the rows upon rows of, uh, you know, North Carolina, uh, forest and uh, so it was just beautiful up there. I think it's the building close to the Compsci 
all the comp side buildings. So go look for the environmental hall. So there's a there's a vote for Granger. Is that what it was called? Granger? Yeah. That doesn't strike a bell, but maybe they <laughs> named it that uh, um, last. They renamed it. Anybody else favorite study spot? I I study, I mean everywhere, <laughs> um, but uh, I mean the Fort Library I think was a good location. I mean nothing super exciting about it, but <laughs> I, it was quiet and um, you know you could find the books you needed. Um, so yeah, the is Fort that, Library. Is that the library in Fuqua? Yep. Gotcha. That's the one. I like staying under Aiden's, like where the game room is. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh, because yeah. if I ever got hungry, I could go to Pitchforks. If I ever needed coffee, there was Bella right there. So that was my favorite spot. Yeah, my roommate worked in the game room. Um, I loved, that's, that's also my favorite study spot. <laughs> that's so fun. Wait, what is, this sounds new. Um, it's, I don't know how new it is, honestly, but it's, it's like got a ton of Xboxes and Playstations and this has nothing to do with working while well one GLI, but I think it's awesome. <laughs> I studied a lot in, uh, Vonderhaven, the pavilion, the, the, like, last thing in the middle of the library. I guess that probably shows how much I studied because it's so loud. There. <laughs> yeah, that's a, definitely a favorite for people. Awesome. I love that. I love the quick response ones. Um, and then going back to some longer form questions, you can have more of a fully developed thought on these. Um, and, and since we're running on time, this is what I really uh, wanted to know, um, is, is what is the best piece of career advice you have gotten? What is the best wisdom you can give to all of us when it comes to career advice? So I can, I can go first. Um, I think the best advice I got is... Um, you know, obviously leverage your skills, right? I mean, your unique upbringing. Um, so know, know where you're coming from, right? Know what your, your assets and capabilities are. Um, and, and, and if you see a problem, right? Um, you know, um, if you see something that is broken, right? Wherever you are, whether it's at work or at school or um, try to fix it. Right. Um, don't just don't just take it at fair value and move on, but actually try to fix it. Um, you know, find find out why you you were presented with that opportunity. In a way, fall fall in love with the problem, right? Um, and and when you do that, you're gonna see things from a different perspective. Um, so that was that was some advice I got a while back, and it's been very very helpful for my career fall in love with the problem i think that's like the quote of the day i love that yeah hello um i'm sorry i are we answering the i don't know what question we're answering i kind of tuned into the question that was just um asked in the chat and uh, that. Oh, so yeah. a really great question was asked about if you want to ask if you want to answer that that's fine too yeah that'd be good um, so how many of you relocated for your jobs and have that affect you as a one GLI student? Uh, how, how scary or intimidating um, was that experience? And had you stay connected with your family after being away from college for so long? Um, or in my case, why did I go back to my hometown? Um, I would say for me, um, yeah, I think part of the reason I came back was just to be closer to family. I just, I didn't get that many opportunities to go back and visit and, I just felt like, you know, right now go off to law school. I just know thing life is going to change, especially after going to grad school. Um, th life accelerates. Uh, I'm gonna, you carry more responsibilities and I might not get as many opportunities to just spend as much time as I want with family. So that, that's the reason I came home. And um, at first I felt like, you know, I wanted to be maybe in a bigger city like DC, New York, um, just like every, you know, a lot of other, other Duke students go. And I felt like maybe I was missing out on that or I wanted to uh, take part in that. But looking back, I, I'm really thankful that I spent time with family. And um, I think it's, uh, I don't think I would do that decision any, make a different decision uh, if I were to go back. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Um, so, so sort of two questions on the table right now. And if anybody wants to answer both or, or just one, that'd be great too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Rachel. Yeah. So I can answer both. So for the first question, best career advice I got from one of my mentors, my second or third year of my career, don't get in your own way. I did a lot of that early on. It's very easy to do. I think for me, um, sometimes I was got in my head too much. And also I would take myself out of the running for opportunities thinking maybe I didn't fit that opportunity or maybe it wasn't for me. But what I've learned at this point is a lot of time, the thing that makes you different that you think is going to keep you out of the running for an opportunity is actually the thing that makes you the most desirable candidate. So my non-traditional background doesn't keep me from opportunities. It actually actually opens more doors and more of the right doors that I actually will like. So um, don't, you know, there's so many opportunities that I closed the door on because I didn't think I would be worth the opportunity or I would make it. And I wish I could go back and not do that as much. And then for moving, yes, I've moved almost every year since I left Duke. And it was, I say that first move was the hardest just because coming out of Duke, you get a lot of times you get your relocation after you start working. And so it can be stressful to try to figure that out on the front end. Thankfully, when you talk to companies now, a lot of them will work with you. Uh, My grandparents helped me out. So that was nice to help bridge that gap. So that was the most difficult move. And it was scary. I didn't know anyone when I made my first move. My roommate was someone random that I met one time and it was very exciting, but I, you know, made it a point to call family pretty often. And I try to visit as much as I could. And at that point I was making a pretty good income so I could start to go home more, which was really nice when I was feeling overwhelmed. Um, so yeah, it's been, for me, it's been exciting. It's been worth it, but I am at the point where I'm like, okay, I think I want to stay in one place now. Um, but it's been nice while I did do all the moving and traveling. Great. Thank you. David. Yeah, this is a really fantastic question. Um, I think by the time I go to school in the fall, I will have lived in 10, 10 different spots um, for various durations since graduating, which just shows that I've been all over for multitudes of reasons. Um, and I think I, at first I was like you know, young go-getter, like, okay, cool, like I can live anywhere. Um, and it, But as I've gotten older, I've realized that the trade-off between exploration and novelty um, with like being somewhere that you have people that you love and communities that you value, it becomes much, a much different trade-off. Um, I don't regret at all being, having explored and like lived in different places and try to see what I like and don't like about the different places that I've been. But yeah, much to re- what Rachel was just saying, like, as you, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting to be old. <laughs> I'm not really sure, but it became more of a trade-off and I'm really happy to, well, right now I'm in and around where my family and communities are and Hopefully we'll be back after school. Um, but yeah, it becomes a much different, uh, much different trade-off as you get older. Uh, but I would say like, if you have the confidence and you feel like it's something you want to try, maybe when you're younger and you don't have as many things holding you back, it, it could be worthwhile trying something, trying a different place. If, if that's something that you feel comfortable and safe doing, but of course that's, those are very important considerations. The best career advice I've gotten was someone told me that um, to first make sure that you have a reason for people to bring you to the table. Um, and his point or their point was basically, you can have all of the excitement and enthusiasm in the world. And of course that's um, going to be important, but if you're with other people that have that same excitement, you kind of have, he, his the idea was that you have to have something that maybe sets you apart, whether that's a skill or a, a point of view or a ability to make the de- decisions or like collectively decide on things uh, was is what will make people remember to invite you to the table, to the decision-making space. Um, so I thought that was really useful as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my, uh, you know, teacher brain is going off right now. It is six fifty-seven, and I always try to cram stuff in at the last few minutes, um, but just being cognizant of people's time. Um, I have one more question, but uh, if we feel like we need to cut it off, we'll cut it off. Um, but I, I want you guys to brag on yourselves a little bit. Um, so as it relates to your career, what was the first win, win that you had that made you confident that you were doing the right thing? If we can just get like two people in here, I think that's great. So what, 
I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would call this the, a good thing, but I, I think it, it, it signaled that I think I was moving in the right direction. Um, I, I, you know, I got my first job out of college and it was in the space that I wanted to be in, right? I, I had fallen in love for, with economics. I wanted to go into investments. Um, I knew I wanted to be in investments because I, I, I wanted to learn how to raise and, and manage money, right? Because eventually I wanted to do that for my family um, as well. And um, so I had the chance to study for the Series 7, Series 66. And there many movies have been made around the Series 7 and 66, right? Wall Street and all those different movies. Um, so when I, when I passed those exams, like many other people that, that took them, I, it just, I don't know, it made me feel very, very happy internally, like, like very satisfied. Um, like I was... Um, moving in the right direction, if you will. And because of that, I mean, that that right there opened up so many different opportunities for me to eventually explore financial planning, wealth management. And I got to learn so much more about the overall process. Um, and um, so that that was incredibly helpful to me back then. Um, the, to, just to, to the question in the chat, and then I'll let uh, Greg, close us out. Um, we did record this and we had a, a little bit of the beginning where we touched on a uh, grad school versus rate working straight from undergrad, um, the time period of wait and things like that. So uh, this will be available for, yeah, you're welcome. This will be available for people to, to view. Yeah. So okay. I just wanted to first thank Tyler for being an exceptional moderator. Um, great questions, great back and forth. I appreciate you um, saying yes to the invitation. Um, I also do want to shout out David, Fabio, Haluk, Rachel, and Brittany. Um, you know, I came to Duke in, last summer, and one of the things that has been so abundantly clear for me is the connection of Duke alums to their alma mater. And, and I appreciate your authenticity, um, your support, uh, your willingness to reach back and to support current Duke students um, Brittany, it's not that far of a reach for you. David makes it seem like it was 20 years ago, but um, I am so grateful for the gifts that you shared uh, to the Duke community tonight. It means a lot um, to me, and I know it means a lot to our students. And uh, the work that we do in the Career Center um, is, only, is only allowed to reach these ways when we have fantastic individuals like you who take time out of their amazing and busy lives to, to give back. So I want you to know how grateful I am um, for the time that you spent with us this evening. Uh, we appreciate everything you do. Uh, I will encourage students to reach out uh, if you want to sort of, so some of our folks are putting emails in. Uh, LinkedIn is an option. Uh, continue these conversations. Thank you once again, Tyler, uh, and our fantastic panelists to the Duke First um, alumni group. So to Rachel and Haluk, who are um, spearheading one of the portions of that group, if you're interested when it's time to graduate Duke, make sure you get connected uh, with them. I don't know if either of you want to do a shout out of the best way for students to connect. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can. <laughs> so either wow. one, we both put our email in there. So um, if you reach out to us, we can definitely get you in touch with when the meetings are going on and what we will be doing. Right. Uh, and, and to our fantastic colleagues in uh, Duke Life, uh, on behalf of everybody here this evening, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be in touch soon. Take care.